Because I think it's, so it's this and the next three questions, and I think they are relatively simple. You just uh, do them all together as one set instead of breaking them up. So, okay, this question says, when the current in one coil changes at a rate of some, um, so I have some rate of change of current, 4.5 amperes per second, and it says, um, so we are dealing with two coils. So I imagine having one coil here and a second coil that's not that coil nearby. And the physical arrangement between them matters. Like uh, having them set, set like this, this is not the, actually the efficient way. When you are working with mutual inductance, you will usually have them nested so that there's a high um, correspondence between magnetic field through one coil and how that magnetic field will end up in the other coil. Like the way I have them arranged right now, it's super uh, inefficient for having uh, two objects that will work as uh, via mutual inductance, but doesn't matter. So let me go through that. So it says, um, so let me call this coil one and we have the rate of current to change through coil one at this rate. And it says that there's a voltage difference that's induced here that's equal to 6.1 millivolts. Okay. Um, oh, I don't know if I remember the formula <laughs> for mutual inductance. It's because I use it so seldom. I'm more used to using the self-inductance formula for inductors, for which we say change of voltage across an inductor is it's a self-inductance times the rate of change of current. Um, let me see if I can guess what the correct induct mutual inductance formula is based on this one that I have memorized. Um, if I were to guess just by analogy, so the mutual inductance from coil one to coil two, one to two, I, I don't know if it's bi-directional, but let's go with this. Um, it's going to fit into this equation. The voltage induced in coil 2 is equal to this mutual inductance times rate of current change in coil 1. Let me give that a try, see if it works. <laughs> um, so solving this for inductance, we have the mutual inductance from coil 1 to 2. Again, I don't remember if it's supposed to be directional. Uh, delta V2 over uh, di1 dt. Okay, so I think we are given all the numbers. We are given the change of voltage in millivolts, and I'm going to want milli prefix at the end, so I think I can leave that be. Um, so I will just uh, type in the numbers, 6.1 divided by, and this is already in the unit of amperes per second, the basic unit of di dt, so 4.5. Uh, 1.36 milli henry, probably. Let's see. Yeah, that's it. Okay, <laughs> I guessed the formula correctly. Let's look at the next question. Um, okay, it says, when a camera uses a flash, a fully charged capacitor discharges through an inductor. Okay, uh, in what time? Uh, so let me draw the uh, circuit of the uh, capacitor with inductor. And they haven't told me the rest, so I'll just leave that before that. Uh, in what time was the 0 0.1 ampere current uh, through uh, inductor of inductance 2.0 millihenry be switched on or off to induce 471 EMF? All right, um, that kind of sounds backwards. Uh, <laughs> Backward in the sense, okay, let me just uh, spell out what my thinking process is. Um, I think in terms of the operation of this thing, uh, really what you have is you have some kind of uh, voltage uh, that's uh, being provided by the capacitor with some sort of circuitry. There might be some sort of uh, step up, step down voltage, but uh, the capacitor has to produce a sufficient voltage to uh, provide the necessary amount of EMF or electromotive force to induce this amount of current in quick enough amount of time. I think that's the forward direction. 
but uh, lucky us, equations don't care about directions of relationships. Really, all we need is the definition of inductance, um, which is uh, defined through this relationship. Voltage of induced across an inductor is its inductance times rate of change of current. So here I'm thinking of, okay, let's think of a constant rate of change. So we can deal with the average rate of change of current. That would be inductance times the total amount of current change over the total amount of time. So looking at this expression, I have voltage, I have, um, I have inductance, I have the total amount of current change from 0 ampere to 0 0.1 ampere, and the, the time is what I need to solve for. So doing that algebra in my head, I get this, and I will plug in the numbers here for the answer. Okay, uh, inductance. Um, let me just do everything in basic SI unit because uh, my um, the, the coefficients are changing and it's annoying. Um, <laughs> so 2.0 millihenry, so times 10 to the power of minus 3 henry, uh, times um, change of current, 0 0.1 ampere, it's already basic SI unit, divided by 471 um, uh, volt EMF. Yeah. So I'll get an answer. This is in a unit of uh, seconds. So to change it to uh, microseconds, oh, I don't know if this syntax will work. Let me give this a try. This times, there are million microseconds in a second, so times 10 to the power of six. Oh, yeah, that works. So 0 0.425 microseconds. Good. Um, just to simple application of definition of inductance. Um, let's look at the next question. So it says a uh, solenoid that is um, centimeters long is wound with, okay, let me start drawing stuff. I have a solenoid um, that's some um, length with some number of turns. The cross-sectional area of the coil is uh, two centi. Okay, so I think what that amount to, to is that it's got some cross-sectional area, and I can calculate it. It's given. What is the self-inductance of the solenoid? Oh, uh, yeah. So this is one of those questions that where you can um, look up the formula if you want, <laughs> but let me show you uh, how you can derive the formula quickly. Um, so let me start out with this. I think I remember the expression. So, you know, solenoid, given some current flowing through it, it generates magnetic field uh, as a function of that current inside the solenoid. Uh, let's suppose that you have that formula for magnetic field of solenoid memorized, which I think I do. Um, so four pi over C squared, uh, the turn density. So I guess uh, in terms of the parameters given, it'll be number of turns per length times the current. I'm pretty sure that's the correct formula. And um, if you want to, wait, four pi k. Uh, if we want to express this in terms of the units that your textbook gives you, in terms of the coefficients, then this would be mu naught uh, n over l i. And uh, if you somehow don't have this memorized, then you can derive it again using Ampere's, uh, Ampere's law. So I guess I'll say uh, can be derived with Ampere's law. So really what we want to do now is um, we want to use Faraday's law to, um, to, to figure out the self-inductance. So the expression for self-inductance is that the voltage induced across delta V is equal to inductance times rate of change of current. And the way you use uh, Faraday's law is Faraday's law says this. It gives you the induced voltage delta V in terms of, uh, I'll, I'll ignore the signs and say absolute value of that is equal to absolute val value of the rate of change of magnetic flux. Okay, and you can relate this magnetic flux with the magnetic field. 
through the definition of magnetic flux, which is magnetic field times area. Okay, so there are a lot of steps to go through, but it's an easy set of steps. So you start out with the magnetic field of solenoid. So you need to write out what is the magnetic flux due to a solenoid. It's going to be that magnetic field, 4 pi k over c squared times n over l times current. And uh, you have to multiply by area. And this is uh, the place to be careful. Um, so I make this mistake every single time. I just multiply by the cross-sectional area we have. <laughs> and what you have to remember is that the effective area you have for the purpose of Faraday's law is the single cross-sectional area of one loop times the number of loops. So I have to remember to multiply by n. Uh, that's my magnetic flux through the solenoid. And I can take the derivative of it with respect to time. And here's the thing. When you take the derivative, um, everything is super simple. Nothing here depends on time except for possibly the current. So it's basically all these constants. Uh, let me combine the n's. So n squared over L times A times just the, this derivative, di dt. And this is going to equal to the induced voltage right here, which means uh, I already have this portion of the, uh, um, this portion here. It's already here. So I can take all of this and read off this as my inductance L. Um, so let me write it out. I think I have all the numbers to calculate this out. Um, so I'll say... Ke is equal to, oh, I think I have this memo right now, uh, 8.99 times 10 to the power of 9, I think. <laughs> if it's not that, then I'll go back and look that up. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. And speed of light is 3 times 10 to the power of uh, 8 meters per second. That's going to be close enough. Um, okay, I think I have all the numbers to calculate. So 4 pi times uh, electric constant divided by speed of light squared times uh, n, uh, that's going to be 550 terms of wire squared divided by L. Uh, I'm going to do that in basic SI unit, so it'll be 0 0.52 meters uh, times for the area. Uh, oh, they gave us the area directly, so I'll have to say 2. Uh, Square centimeters, I have to co imagine converting it to square meter, so it's going to be, um, so, yeah. <laughs> let me not do that in my head. So, one square centimeter, I have to imagine multiplying by a factor of one. So, something with a square meter on top, square centimeter on bottom, one square meter is 100 uh, squared, uh, square centimeter, yeah. So I need to take the 2 and divide it by 100 squared. Okay. Um, that's the area. I think that's it. Okay. All the answers. Uh, I'm going to take that output and uh, put it into decimal approximation so that I can uh, <laughs> so that I can enter it more easily. Um, yeah. So that's the decimal approximation. Let me. So that should be in the basic SI unit, Henry. I'm going to change that to Minley Henry by taking it and multiplying it by 10 to the power of 3 uh, because there are 1,000 Milli Henrys in the Henry. So 0 0.146. Let's hope that's right. If not, I might have to figure out what I did wrong. <laughs> okay, so that's right. Good. So we do the correct uh, answer in mind. Um, one thing that's uh, useful to uh, notice, some, uh, well, sometimes useful to notice is just to see how simple, um, how simple these steps were. Just uh, looking at um, the steps that supposedly involves calculus, it's, uh, uh, it's super simple. <laughs> like uh, there wasn't any actual calculus here. So sometimes uh, you will, you might see uh, inductance defined this way. Instead of these uh, fundamental relationships, you might see uh, inductance. <laughs> inductance L in the unit of Henry defined this way. Um, 
the magnetic flux divided by current. Instead of the usual way, the way I've been defining it, induced voltage divided by di dt. And if you see inductance described as this, so note how if you had used this, you'll have gotten still the same correct answer. And really what this does is it skips the application of Faraday's law step. Because, yeah, it turns out, I mean, you do need to understand Faraday's law to understand why there's going to be a voltage difference later on. But if you're just calculating it, you can calculate inductance as the magnetic flux divided by the current. It cancels out the right dynamical factors still. All right, uh, so that's uh, that. Uh, was that the last question? No. Uh, it says uh, some inductor. Oh, wow, that is a fairly large uh, inductor. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen 15 Henry inductor. It might be like some big industrial thing. It says uh, some inductor with some amount of inductance carries some amount of current. Okay. How much I said zero degrees could be melted by energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor? Oh, yeah. So here you have to just remember some formulas. Um, I derived this uh, expression for you in lecture. I'm just going to say I have it memorized and use it. Amount of energy stored in inductor is given by one half the inductance times I squared. Um, I guess the way I have this memorized is I memorized it like I have kinetic energy memorized. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And there's actually a wonderful analogy between uh, mechanics of this form and the circuit uh, expressions of this form. But I'll just leave that there, that there is an analogy. You can look it up on your own. So uh, we've been given all the parameters we need to calculate the energy stored in the inductance. Um, so let me actually just calculate it here. So I have um, one half times inductance, 15 Henry times current, 21 ampere, all large values. Um, so this inductor in the current that's going through it or in the magnetic field, it's currently storing 3.308 uh, kilojoule of energy uh, or 3,307 joule of energy. Um, so if uh, all this is getting released into an ice at the melting point, then I think we can write it out this way. Your textbook question already gave you the latent heat of fusion, and by giving you that number, kind of hinted at you that you probably want to use the expression for heat needed to cause a fusion or melting to happen. That's going to be the latent heat of fusion times the amount of material. Um, so we already have Q, that's that number there. So if we just divide by latent heat of fusion, then we'll get mass in the unit of gram. Okay, so I, let's do that. So we are going to uh, take this answer, uh, put seven, divided by latent heat of fusion, 334. And that's uh, how much ice will melt, 9.9 uh, .9 grams. Wow, that's small. Um, the, cur the circuit parameters here are fairly large, but um, the amount of ice it will melt is kind of tiny, uh, which, I don't know, is surprising to me. Um, yeah, so 